All right, here we go. I think we're we're connecting. We'll give everybody a few minutes to come in when we uh, start up. Yeah, it's right, we... we're a little bit behind. Are we in? Sorry yeah, about that. That's my dogs. No worries. Um, didn't. Oh, uh, it's we're live. All right, cool. I think we are. Yeah. Um, you see us in there? There we go. All righty. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I guess we'll give a few minutes for people to get in. We'll do a quick intro and then we'll probably do a quick intro again. Um, we started a few minutes late. Uh, my name is Jay Garrett. For you that, those of you that don't know me, I'm here with uh, my business partners and co-owners at NJ Realty Pros, Alan Hack and Anna Sapanova. And special guests today, Frank Minetti and Robert Gill. Frank Minetti is with Advisors uh, Mortgage. And uh, Robert Gill is a financial advisor who's going to be telling us about ways to uh, protect your assets and investments um, to basically avoid, uh, avoid loss in a situation like we're going through now. Uh, right now, let's see. Um, just waiting for a few people to hop on. We got some people coming in now. And then we'll get started. And anybody, if anybody wants to text the questions, I'll leave my number. You can text direct. It's 718-313-7751. And anything that I get, I'll bring up in the show to um, discuss as we go along. So I don't know if you're able to yeah, run that. So I'm going to, Anna, I'm going to, I'm going to put it in the comments so people can see it um, when they're in there. Text your questions to 718-313-7751. All right. All right. I think we could get started. People will hop in as we go along and there'll be a recording of it. So, all right, everyone, just uh, again, um, my name is Jay Garrett. I'm with Alan Hack and Anna Safanova, my business partners and owners of NJ Realty Pros. We're here with Frank Minetti of Advisors Mortgage and uh, Robert Gill, who's a financial advisor, and he's going to be talking to us today about, you know, ways to diversify our money, uh, protect investments to, you know, avoid losses in situations such as uh, COVID-19. So I guess uh, without further ado, I'll get started. And uh, how's it going? Thanks for, for coming on today, Rob and Frank. Yeah, awesome. Glad to be here, guys. My pleasure. It's yeah. my pleasure, and thank and thank you for the invite. Oh, no problem. We're happy to have you. Yeah, we, we we I guess what we were talking about. I know Anna and I. You know, we've done a bunch of these interviews, and you know what's really come up is like a lot of people that we know personally. Um, obviously, we don't know. Also, they've been hit pretty hard um, with their you know I guess their their wealth um, from the decline in the stock market. Uh, and we noticed, you know, certain things like, you know, real estate are a little bit more stable as of now. So we just wanted to you know, have somebody come on and, and give us some tips and pointers on, you know, best practices. Yeah. Frank, do you want to go first or how, how do you want? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll talk a little bit on the investment side of the real estate investment side. So, you know, it's super unfortunate what we're dealing with as a country. And obviously, we were just talking and chatting with everybody before we got started that, you know, my 30 years of doing this, never seen anything like this. Yes, we've been through market up and downs, but we've never been through anything that was caused, you know, a market fluctuation that was caused by, you know, like this COVID-19 thing. So, um, you know, there's always a silver lining to every cloud. And looking at you know, my own situation financially and, and looking at my client situation and my friends and family, um, you know, there's still opportunity out there. There's still real estate opportunity out there. And um, just just doing some research over these last couple, couple weeks, you know, in conjunction with stocks, bonds, uh, 401ks, and then looking at the property side of things. Um, still opportunity, like I said. And, you know, when, when you're looking specifically at investment properties, um, the one thing to know about investment property purchases is um, it really is recession proof. 
And why is it recession proof? Well, real estate investing, uh, specifically from the cash flow side, just looking at you know the, the the acquisition of property for rental income versus flipping of a property. A flipping of a property is not recession proof, whereas uh, cash flow for rental income can be, because real estate investments of that type will always prove out over time. So when you have positive cash flow coming in on a property you own no matter how long a, a market recession or market correction goes on or market decline over time, it will always come back and it will always pay, you know, pay dividends. Uh, and you're not the one paying for those dividends. It's whoever is obviously, you know, your tenant base is. So it's number one, it, it, it offers predictable cash flow, um, always appreciates in value eventually. Doesn't have to be today or tomorrow, um, but over time it will always play out. Now, some people will say, well, that can be um, inflation related. Yes, it can be. But the bottom line is um, real estate appreciation was really always supposed to mimic um, inflation. So that really what is what drives the appreciation. When we look back to some historic events, and I'm just going to talk about that for a couple of seconds, because um, a lot of people are comparing uh, 2020 to what happened in 2008, and they are distinctly different and caused by completely different reasons. But again, purchasing property for um, positive cash flow is always going to build equity and wealth. And it, on top of that, and Rob will speak to this, I'm sure, it'll afford you tax breaks and deductions. So there's a major upside to purchasing property for cash flow. Um, and then, like I said, comparing it to 2008, which everybody's doing, and you even see that myself, I'm guilty of it by posting, um, you know, social media content that's comparing the two. When you look at what happened in 2007 and eight, and what led up to that. So 2000 to 2005 market appreciation, and this is nationalized, not regionalized, but property values appreciated to the tune of 56 plus percent. Whereas 2014 to 2019 property appreciation was much less um, and more, more flat, and it was 31%. So really the difference between 2020 is our industry was blamed for causing the economic crash. When you get into the subprime mortgage market, um, over you know, supposedly over inflation of values, I don't want to get into that because there's a lot more that went on besides um, and really where the blame may have been. But this time around, we're not the ones causing the problem. Obviously, it's a COVID-19 crisis, but it's the first time uh, in a long time the housing market is actually poised to bring us out of the current conditions because property values um, were steadily increasing. Um, you know, nationally in 17 and 18, the high point for 17 was 6.4%. In 18 and 19, all the other years, it was right around four to five percent appreciation from 14 to 20. So we don't have a bubble, at least in my opinion, that everybody was talking about. Um, we are good sources that I trust are predicting an initial average drop in prices for 2020, regionalized somewhere around four to 12 percent. But it's all going to depend upon how long we're going to wind up in this situation. When the economy opens, um, we believe this is going to be a V-shaped recovery. So we had a sharp decline. You know, I'm looking at the stocks that I was interested in purchasing. And if you were smart enough, and I wasn't, to get in mid-March when the market bottomed out, a lot of those have recovered at least 50% of the, the losses they had. So you had an opportunity there. Um, and the same thing I think is going to happen with the real estate market. We may have an initial uh, downturn, but we're going to have a V-type recovery. So it's going to be a, a, a sharp decline and a quick incline. So, you know, again, I, I think it affords an opportunity for growth, affords an opportunity for positive cash flow, and it's going to always play out over time. So, I mean, that's kind of just my idea of what I think is going on in the marketplace. And, you know, you guys could talk even better than I can on what you're seeing out there, you know? Yeah, and I, I think one of the things um, in regards to, like, I, being through as an agent, being through seven and eight, and Alan was too, I think one of the biggest um, things that is different this time is because of the reasoning and because it happened so quick, you have a different uh, situation with supply and demand. So mm -hmm. what happens, you know, traditionally when a market goes down and you see a dip is there's like a slow transition from, you know, a seller's market to a buyer's market. 
and inventory changes over time. But what happened here is, you know, everything just stopped at once. So, you know, sellers don't want people in the house. Buyers are being, you know, protective about, you know, catching Corona. And then there's still a group of serious both or, or people that need to need, need to move and need to buy or people that lost out on three or four bidding wars that are trying to buy something now. And what's happening is both went down, but I think they kind of, you know, balanced off a little bit. Whereas normally when, when the market shifts, it would go all the way in the favor of, of buyers. Whereas now it's just, it's, you know, a proportionate amount of houses. The, like if you look at how many are listed, there's a lot less than before this and there's less buyers too. And there were so many people, like I was saying, right before this all happened, we went to an open house. I was with clients and we stopped by an open house, actually two in Marlboro. And there were 60 people at this open house. It was, it was uh, that showed up in the two hours and it was in the five to 600 range. It was a pretty popular range. There was only five houses for sale. So you have a lot of demand beforehand. Some of it, of course, is going to go away if somebody doesn't get their job back. But to balance off the fact that there was 60 versus five options, you know, I have a feeling that, like you said, it's going to, you know, there might be an initial down, but it's going to shoot right back up because I'm sure 40 or 45 of those people are still going to want to buy afterwards because they have whatever reason they were for buying. Right, right. Hey, Jay, I, I need to maybe just so you know, like Frank, Dan, I'm sorry. What I was, what I was going to say, say is actually the same thing happened in 2001, Frank, if you recall. After 9-11, oh, yeah. pretty much the world came to a, a standstill for several months, kind of like what we're going through now, and it was the same right. situation. Right. And that might even be a better comparison than what people are trying to compare it to 07 and 08. You know, because an outside catastrophic event comes in and just shuts down, you know, shuts down everything. You know, it's and obviously some of the similar industries were hit hard, you know, travel and, you know, and tourism, those related industries. So I think that may even be a better comparison. But the market rebounded pretty quickly after that, you know. I think so. And there is a lot of, in, I mean, a lot of inventory is going to come on. I have you know, uh, clients, people who are kind of hold it off till everything will settle yeah. down. However, I do have more buyers now versus sellers. So I think we're really going to bounce back pretty quickly. Um, and I think mm -hmm. we're really going to see a lack of inventory with everything that's going on. Um, and just like Jay said, some of the people are probably going to fall out because there might be a loss of job and that would be probably temporarily as well. So we might have a bit of a dip, but otherwise I, I don't see it, uh, you know, being a long-term issue. Um, yeah. so some of the recession proofs, and I actually just got um, a text from someone. So people have money in 401k and savings accounts. Should they invest that now? And I guess question that's for you, Rob. Yeah. Uh, your perspective, the savings and 401k, you know, people obviously they, they lost a little bit of money, you know, in there with everything that's going on. Should they touch that now or should they leave it alone? What would be your best advice on that? Um, first of all, I appreciate the question. And if it's okay, I want to take a step back. So instead of answering the question in a vacuum, I could pretty much circle back in and give a better global understanding of exactly what we got going on. So from a standpoint of if we look at the if we look at today versus uh, 2008, and there is major differences. And if we look at 2001, there is one similarity for about seven days, right? And I think that uh, where we stand today, my research has took me back to previous flus. So I, I began to look at the Spanish flu of 1918. And you realize pretty quick when you do the research, there was, I think, like 500,000 citizens that died and maybe 50 million people around the world. And they really, they involved themselves in a herd immunity kind of mindset. But the thing that stood out the most to me when I dug deeper was that there was 1.6 or 1.7 billion people around the world. Now there's 7 billion. And obviously we are doing this in a much more um, educated way on being able to figure out how to get through this until they come up with a vaccine. With that being said, uh, let me just clarify Epic. Epic has two divisions, Epic Insurance Services and Epic Wealth Management. 
I run the insurance services division. On the wealth management, management side, we have five different fiduciaries that are in that space. So when it comes to understanding 401ks, obviously money goes in with pre-tax dollars, it comes out taxed as ordinary income, right? And if we look at anything we do, I think before anyone does anything with money, what is the investment philosophy? Now, I've, been, I've known Frank for over 15 years now. I know what his philosophy is, right? I know I, I have an idea what all you good folks, your philosophy is, and that's, you know, buy real estate. And if you're going to be buying income producing real estate, you want to get four different rates of return with the same dollar, which is cash flow, mortgage interest write off, depreciation, and you expect the property to appreciate over time. Like contributing to a 401k in a down market and like just buying one piece of investment pro property, unless there's a true philosophy on how you utilize your money, where you want your money to be, not only today from a tax perspective, but what does that look like later on when you're taking distributions? And on the distribution side, how does your assets work together? So everything that we do, we want to make sure all the planners are on the same, same page, whether it's the real estate agent. Uh, whether it's the accountant, the uh, stockbroker, the insurance agent, the trust officer, if everybody's on the same page for the benefit of what you're doing with your money, then your decision making is going to be based on logic, math, and science, certainly not emotional timidity or gut level hunch. Same is, same, same is true when it comes to doing paperwork the right way with the PPP and the EIDL. So to answer the 401k question, if the goal is to continue to do that systematically over the long term, um, like everything else, I believe this too shall pass. There will be a new, there'll be a new order of things. There'll be a new normal. I don't know exactly what that looks like from a currency standpoint. I don't know what that looks like from a standpoint of, you know, maybe people won't shake hands and, and there'll be a lot of social distancing, but you know, I don't think that there's any argument when it comes to real estate, tangible property that can give you multiple rates of return over the long term. You know, that's the place to be no matter what economic uh, situation we're in, providing their sober thinking with the proper discipline. Okay. So some of the safer investments now from everything where we are, obviously, you know, and again, like you said, 401k, my personal belief, if you have it, maybe you should hold on to it just like a real estate. If it did go down slightly, it will probably eventually go up as well. Um, what would you invest in right now? What is your sense of a safe investment? Well, you know, one of my, I, I have a YouTube um, influencer who's a partner of mine and his name is Chris Crone. And Chris, Chris literally buys, he has a turnkey operation. Um, he literally buys one investment property a day. And when he does it, he likes to complement it with cash value life insurance. Uh, cash value life insurance with its inherent guarantees by state law and by contract and the concept for the entrepreneur to use the money like a bank what he likes to do in that situation is utilize life insurance, you know, as the cash value builds up, whether the market's going up or down, you're getting that guarantee. He's going out there buying real estate and having the renter pay back his policy. Well, the same could be said that, hey, listen, if, if the market is, is definitely something that's making you uncomfortable and you're looking for a steady eddy, whether it's a fixed annuity or a guarantee rate of return, and you put that in your overall financial mosaic, just got to figure out from a cash flow perspective exactly what that savings looks like. Uh, from that space, providing you're healthy, um, the insurance company will reward you with a rating and, and a dividend that ties it into your guarantee. So to answer the singular in a vacuum question, that's what I would say. But I like to couch that with being part of the overall financial mosaic. Hey, Rob, let me ask you a question. Um, yes, I know there's two different schools of thought. Maybe me and you have even talked about this before, but looking at maybe somebody that's new to the real estate industry or just new, you know, younger person, new to their career, uh, company offers a 401k, they have an entrepreneurial spirit, you know, they're thinking about moving beyond what they're currently doing, um, you know, just starting out, but really have goals and aspirations to be a high net worth individual, right? So yep. for example, using a 401k, because most you know, most companies provide it or offer that to their employees um, since it's tax deferred and not tax exempt. Yep. So they're, they're, they're basically avoiding taxes where they are tax bracket wise now, but going to be taxed later, later on at a different, you know, tax rate. But they're planning on being, you know, a high net worth individual in the future. Does yep. a 401k really make sense for that person? 
because they're going to wind up maybe being taxed at a higher rate later on than now? Yeah, great. Thank you. That's an awesome question. And um, for the entrepreneur who wants leverage, liquidity, and control, who is disciplined, understands risk, and has a long-term point of view versus somebody who maybe doesn't know how to save properly, um, would be a literal cowboy if they had access to their money, which is where I think a 401k would serve that person better. But someone that really wants to control their outcome, their destiny, understand the effects of taxation later on by, by the educational process of, we don't know what taxes are gonna be 10 or 20 years from now, um, and has the mindset, the research and the team behind him or her when it comes to buying rental real estate, I, I think that's what you're talking about. Um, I believe that, or even selling it, I believe that, um, that that person would be better suited understanding the entrepreneurial side and, and, and maybe not be caught up in the 401k. Now, with that being said, if the person could save 20% of their income, and let's say, you know, there's a company match on a 401k, maybe I would go up to the match for the person mm -hmm. you're describing. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, an entrepreneur is going to be an entrepreneur and they're going to want to have access, liquidity and control. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's been my experience. Yeah, I agree. You, you yeah, so, 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 so for all you guys, oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, you, you, you finish up because I was going to go back to something you said before. What, what I was going to share, and this is not a recommendation, and I'm not sure if you guys or gals are aware of this, but uh, based on COVID-19 and based on, I think, what the stimulus package came out with regarding 401ks, there is the ability for people to tap into that under 59 and a half without a 10% penalty up to 100 grand where they could pay the taxes on that 100 grand over three years. Um, so, so I know that there's certain folks that have a certain flavor of risk and understanding that are kind of going in that direction. By no means is this a recommendation, but it is good to be aware. Uh, if, you have, if, you're, if you're owning a business and you're waiting for your PPP or you're waiting for your EIDL, which I don't know anyone that's gotten it yet, um, and you do need cash flow, there is opportunities. Awesome. Okay. Good to know, Rick. And uh, I just want to go back as you when you were saying about the four advantages um, of of like real estate investing. Can you go yeah. over just a little bit um, on the tax benefits? Because I don't think that's one thing. You know, obviously, like appreciation and cash yeah. flow are, are things people think of right away, but they don't often notice the the tax benefits. Yes. Um, so obviously, once again, when people buy real estate as an investment, their goal and all the reading that they'll do in the research, typically, and I'm just gonna speak across averages, would be to get four different rates of return. Number one would be cash flow. Uh, that's, you know, whatever, whatever you're gonna charge rent minus the mortgage payment, cash flow in your pocket, um, money while you're sleeping. Number two would be, you assume the property from the day you buy it to the day you sell it is gonna go higher, right? Just from an inflationary standpoint. Um, number three would be a mortgage interest write-off. So you bought the property for hundred grand, you put 20,000 down, whatever the interest is on the 80,000 is a write off on your income. But this is a conversation you have to have with your accountant. Uh, and number four, there is the ability to depreciate that asset on your tax return. So, and I'll give you the bifurcation of it, but when you depreciate the asset on your tax return, you pay less your taxes will go down because you're going to be taxed on less money that's connected to that depreciation. For example, if you're making a hundred grand and then a year later you buy a property and you depreciate it, you may only have to report 70, 60 or 80 and pay taxes on that number. Now the long-term challenge with depreciation in real estate is when you recover it later on in life, if you sell the property, whereas the 1031 exchanges come into play. But if you do sell it, you have to recapture that depreciation. A lot of entrepreneurs out there utilize cash value life insurance, and by no means is this a plug, but they'll use cash value life insurance to complement that depreciation as well as that recover of the, pre the recovery of depreciation later on in life. So hopefully I was able to answer your question. Yeah, that was awesome because I don't think everybody, it, it, it's more so uh, not one of the more apparent uh, benefits. And I think it's a huge benefit um, that, you know, if people start reading into it and looking into it, it makes it a little bit more attractive than some other investments. Yeah, and, you, and to your point, if you have sober thinking, long-term thinking, 
And what I mean by sober, I mean, you know, you're not, your judgment isn't clouded. You're not trying to make, uh, you're not trying to buy a property today, sell it 30 days later. If you have a long-term systematic approach that is with discipline and understanding of, you know, the different risks that are out there and you stay in that space as time goes on, we could accomplish a lot more in 10 years than we imagined and usually less than what we thought we can in one year. But somewhere in that space, that's where the real magic happens. Awesome. I have a quick question. How did your uh, partner get it, uh, get to buying a property a day? How long did that take to work up to? <laughs> so um, you can follow him on, check him out on, on YouTube. It's Chris Krohn, K-R-I-S-K-H-R, no, K-R-O-H-N, Chris Krohn. Um, he is a, he's a YouTuber. And as a result of that, he uh, does videos every day. And it's a lot of educational content. He's been doing it since 08. So initially, he was a just a real estate guy that's now become like a financial coach or a business coach. And his the way his channel is geared, where he has over 500,000 subscribers that grows every day, they will get in touch with his team through the channel to become partners with him to buy real estate. So he's taken his model, he synthesized that he scaled it, and now he partners with whoever wants to be his partner. And he has a team that goes all around the country. I think there's like 314 different real estate markets that they go after. Wow. And their team, it's a turnkey operation where, you know, the team basically just finds the property. They're going to, they're going to handle the broken glass and, you know, removal of the snow and, and fix the toilet bowl and all that other stuff. And, and it's, it's about really tapping into that overall environment. So there's people every day that look to partner up with them. Awesome. And he owns a lot of life insurance to complement that strategy. That's cool because that, that, that protects. Frank, the right Go ahead, Anna. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Frank, are there right any? So obviously, we hear that FHA mortgages will probably gonna go away at some point. Obviously, the red changes with the JP Morgan Chase with 20% mm -hmm. down. What do you see happening in terms of financing, um, you know, investments going forward and just FHA in general? Is that gonna go away? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, right now it's it's company specific. You know, you mentioned you, you mentioned JP Morgan Chase, and I, I know I was sharing with you guys this morning. I was talking to one of my clients who happens to work for them, and we got an announcement, and I found out through through another company who uses Chase as a you know wholesale investor for them that obviously they've limited their LTVs, so they're they're kind of maxing everybody out at an eighty LTV, with and they won't loan, lend above seven hundred credit scores. Um, some of the bigger banks had dropped out of FHA a long time ago. What we're seeing right now is we're seeing price fluctuations and deviations in the rate interest rate market as far as FHA goes, but both FHA and VA are still available on our side. So, you know, us as a direct seller to Fannie Mae and Freddie, we are not direct Ginnie Mae sellers, so we're not selling directly um, on, on the FHA stuff, but our investor pools are still doing FHA financing. What we've seen go away though, are the lower credit scores. Um, I have been able to in the last year to do buyers as low as 550 credit scores with compensating factors like a large down payment. Um, wow. We were doing 585 as a regular basis, you know, as long as there was something uh, that wasn't precluding them from obtaining financing. So if they fit guidelines and it was going through an AUS platform, we were doing 585. We are now seeing 620 minimums. Um, there's a case by case where we can go lower than that, but um, you know, the interest rate side to that is, is pretty terrible, you know, whereas before, you know, somebody with a, you know, 620 credit score and an FHA versus 585 might only been like a three eighths percent difference in the interest rate environment. So we have no forward looking uh, guidance that says FHA is going anywhere, but it's tightening up, at least from the perspective of um, credit, for sure. Uh, we haven't seen any tightenings in AUS. I mean, I just literally, before I hopped on with you guys this morning, I ran a client through with halfway decent credit, 680 credit score, and was able to get them approved with a 56 debt to income ratio. So that's still going on. Fannie and Freddie are still loaning up to 49 debt to income. You will not see that on investment property, though. Uh, investment property would seem to be capped out. Of, we were basically capped out at 45%. Um, but again, what we're seeing from a risk perspective is the layering of risk is infecting the interest rate. So what do I mean by that? 
if you're looking to purchase a single family investment property, 20% down is the minimum down payment requirement, but you're seeing an interest rate environment that's significantly different than if you're putting down 25%. When, and that's, you definitely, the, you know, the higher the credit score, the better the interest rate environment, certainly on every product, but specifically for investment. When you get into like layering risk with multifamilies, then you're talking about, you know, a little bit higher, a little bit higher. And that's really the overall guidance we're seeing right now in the mortgage market is the more layering of risk, the worse the interest rate and um, tightening of credit scores might happen. We've also seen, um, and I don't know how, if you guys have taken advantage of some of these products, the non-QM stuff, which for anybody that's new out there just stands for non-qualified mortgage product. So like portfolio type lending, specifically pertaining to investment properties, where we were doing those uh, pity wash programs. Basically, if, if the property's uh, rental analysis done by the appraiser washes out the principal interest taxes and insurance percent, so it's 100% um, coverage on that with rental income, we weren't even verifying employment. You know, those types of, um, those types of programs are now basically on hold waiting to see what's coming back, you know, market wise, there's a couple people still doing them out there. But I was getting flooded with investors that would do it, you know, do it. It's a broker product for us. But we were seeing 30 companies I'd get emails from a day that would have that type of product available. So that's also starting to tighten. And that's that part is similar to 07 and 08. Because the first thing that obviously went away was the subprime market. Not that that non-QM is a subprime product, it's just an alternative documentation of income product. So we're starting to see those tighten a bit. Awesome. And I actually have a question that came in while we were chatting. So with investment properties with 20% down, do, um, do you look at uh, income and uh, debt, debt to income ratios? We do, we do. Yes. So there's there's been a change in the way Fannie and Freddie looks at um, investment property income. Um, and that came out in February. So it's still the trade. We're still using your traditional, you know, source of income, whether you're self-employed or, or your W-2 employee, salaried hourly, whatever that goes in the mix. And then one of the biggest benefits to doing uh, financing on an investment property is you could use the anticipated cash flow from the uh, property you were purchasing towards qualifying for the property up to 75% of what the appraiser states is fair market rent. Now what's changed, and I actually wrote it down because it's so new, I didn't wanna mess it up, but there, you, there were really no restrictions on using that 75% um, cash flow for the, the subject property. That changed in February. So right now, if you have a current housing expense on the property and you have at least one year history of owning a rental property, there is no restrictions. You can still go up to those numbers for using income to qualify. If you have a current housing expense and no rental management or property experience, you can use just enough to cover the print of rent and taxes of the insurance of the property. So in other words, if you've got a mortgage payment of a thousand, but your positive cash flow would be 1200, you can only use a thousand towards the income. And if you have um, no, no history of using uh, of, of any type of uh, primary residence, mortgage payment or rent, and you, you have uh, obviously no, in, no ownership in an investment property, you cannot use any rent income to qualify. So that's been the subtlety that changed back in February. But again, we're still lending on investment property. So that's the good news. Um, yeah, so and, and what... I definitely want to put in my notes to make everybody aware, um, especially now that some of the other outside non-QM products are dwindling. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac allow for up to 10 finance properties. So you can, and that includes if you have a primary plus whatever investment property you have. So Fannie and Freddie are still in the business of lending on investment property as well. So there are, like I said, there's still uh, financing opportunities out there. We haven't curtailed any of our products you know, at least that if I can speak to only two advisors. So we're still lending on all our product lines, you know, with the exception of those uh, non-traditional income sources. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually one of our uh, agents that's that's watching, he brought up a good point, uh, Jason. What's up, Jason? Uh, so yeah, Jason Leslie from our office uh, brought up uh, opportunity zones. 
So, and I, this is probably, especially if anybody had the foresight to liquidate any of their investments on the top end of this uh, crash, um, so, or so to speak, I guess it's a crash, but uh, opportunity zones, what they'll, what they'll do is uh, if you go on um, the New Jersey website, if you just Google New Jersey opportunity zones, they have it in every state, but they have certain areas that are labeled or deemed uh, opportunity zones that they're trying to, I guess, attract economic development to. And if you invest in those areas and you have to speak to your accountant for all the details, but what they'll do is if you buy real estate in that area and you have a gain, it's almost like a 1031 exchange, but 1031 exchanges are just real estate to real estate. This is if you were to liquidate like a stock and you had, you know, a huge gain and you had to pay taxes on it, you could defer the gain. I think it's up to six years. It's, it's definitely at least five or six years. And not only that, if you hold on to that property for 10 years, when you sell that property, you don't have to pay any capital gains on it. Uh, so that, that's the long and short of it. It's definitely worth looking into. Uh, and it's really, you know, it's designed. There's some, there's some good areas to, if you go on, uh, on the website and you look, there's a lot of areas that are convenient to most places. Like I know Friel Borough has some, Asbury has some parts. I think uh, Long Branch, Flemington, uh, you know, some, sometimes you, you know, just good opportunities. Um, definitely worth looking into. Hey, Rob, real quick question for you. Yep. Um, I, I know my philosophy on this. Just want to check with yours. Um, looking at investment property purchases yep. right now, because of what's going on financing wise, you're basically closing in, in a personal name. What's your feeling about moving those properties into an LLC ownership and should each individually from a protection standpoint uh, be moved into its own individual, you know, entity to protect against, um, you know, any, anything catastrophic? Yeah. Great question, Frank. And I think this is where it's important. And, and you and I have always talked about this, where the accountant, the, the attorney, the planner, the realtor, all are on the same page, because to that point, um, you know, I'm under the belief, I know for me, when I, when I buy investment properties, they're in separate LLCs for exactly what you're talking about, which is another layer of protection from the things that we can't control. You know what I mean? So whether it's a lawsuit or, or, you know, whether there's an accident at the house or right around the perimeter of the house or in the backyard of the house or the rental property, you still want to be able to have that protection. So yeah, that's a great question. And it's the, I think the small distinctions and the, um, you know, the riches are in the niches. I mm -hmm. think in the space of really understanding that and being a, um, a slave to the discipline of that can go a long way as time goes on. Uh, Frank, what about investing uh, a financing in an LLC's name? Is that, po how, how does that work? It, it's difficult. Uh, and it, it, we've had investors that do it, um, not the greatest rates that you'd get through like a Fannie or Freddie type product. Um, but they will allow for it. Um, there, there's a there's a guideline right now with Fannie uh, and Freddie that say um, if you let, let's say you 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 buy a property as an owner occupied property, you live in it for 12 months, they're okay with you transferring the property over to an LLC, and it wouldn't um, it wouldn't uh, facilitate the uh, escalation clause. Uh, you know, I actually reached out to Fannie this morning because the guideline was kind of vague because I knew we might be talking about this. And I, I just had asked them whether or not if you immediately purchase a, um, a, a investment property, so they, you know, it's structured as an investment property that can be immediately flipped. They haven't gotten back to me yet. And I haven't had an opportunity to ask them that question in a long time. Um, you know, it's, it's a slippery slope. You, you obviously want to consult your attorney in anything you do, your accountant, like Rob said, but there are some products out there that will allow you to purchase straight in the name of an LLC. Uh, many people move them later, but you have to be careful about doing that to make sure it's compliant with whatever your mortgage product is. Um, you know, and, and to, what, to speak to what Rob said, I can give you a, a, for instance, out of my own personal experience, um, I was always one to just because, um, you know, my guidance and, and talking, you know, me and Rob and, and some of our, our, our uh, associates had talked back in the day, I moved every one of my properties individually into their own individual LLC. And 
on the other end of this, I was lucky enough to get into the Asbury Park market. If any, I know a lot of you guys are a lot younger than I am, but Alan remembers this for sure. Late nineties and Rob probably does too. When Asbury Park had went through that whole house of cards thing, you know, with the uh, fraudulent investing, uh, or, you know, artificially inflated appraisals with a couple groups of people and the Asbury Park broke the story. Asbury Park real estate fell apart. Um, I was lucky enough to get in on really the second round of those properties, uh, purchasing those properties when they were still super deflated as far as values go. And I remember like it was yesterday, purchasing a property from somebody who got in on the first round and they had, they had purchased hundreds of properties in Asbury on the other side of the collapse. And they put every single property in the name of one LLC or at that time it was an escort. Problem wow. was one of their contractors came along and sued them and tied up the, every single property they had in that lawsuit for like a year. Yep. So they couldn't sell one of those hundred properties for a year. And I hung around and waited because I didn't, didn't matter to me, but these are good guys really trying to do right by Asbury renovating, you know, that first round of properties that, you know, in the middle of that mess. And they wound up having a contract to tie up a hundred properties for a year. So that's, you know, you, you don't want that to happen, you know? Absolutely. I guess, um, well, we're just about up on time, but to cap things off. If, 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 questions. I'm sorry. Uh, they come sure. in as we chat. I don't want to interrupt anybody, but Question came in. I think this is more of an opinion, but uh, do you think the market will, when will, when it will open up this COVID-19, will it wait away some of the night flippers? So I guess the quick fix guy, somebody who is newer in the business, um, mm -hmm. I guess this is one of the agents where had some challenges and they work with somebody more of experience. Will it wait away some of the, you know, somebody who's newer, I guess, maybe from finance and standpoint or just an opinion in general? What do you guys think? I can speak to that a little bit too. Um, I think a lot of that's happened already too, even before COVID-19. I know me and Alan and Jay talk about this a lot. Um, from somebody that started flipping properties back in the early 2000s to moving forward now, it's a whole different time. You know, It's so much more competitive. I think there's more professional flippers involved in the mix. Um, you know, because they're working on slimmer, you know, ROI than you did years ago because of the competitive nature of the marketplace. Um, what I am seeing, um, and you guys know some of the, especially Alan and Jay, you know, some of my investors that do the, the flip financing for us, they're still lending. So there's, there still seems to be money available in that space. However, I think maybe somebody that was just getting into it now may certainly kind of just fall by the wayside just because of what's going on. You know, it's, 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 you know, it's an interesting market as far as that goes, because it is so time, you know, so time critical to, um, you know, when you're working on your timelines, especially if you have financing to, you know, to, to try to meet your financing goals of getting that property done in, in your timeframes and get rid of it, you know, get rid of your, 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 your loan on your, your, on your financing and your interest. So I think some people might, but I think a lot of people had already fallen away. That's my opinion can, anyway. Can I use that as an access point? If that's okay, Anna? Absolutely. So, so because I think it's important for the people out there um, and, and I don't sell real estate. I do believe in rental real estate as part of the overall mosaic. So when I look at what happened in 08 with quantitative easing, which is really the, the uh, offshoot of, of debt monetization. And if I look at the $2.2 trillion stimulus package that just hit, uh, my thought goes immediately to inflation and the bifurcation of inflation. And this will tie into the long-term real estate player. Um, from 08 until now, if you look at food, clothing, gasoline, and oil, the prices have pretty much stayed the same. However, if you look at higher education, medical costs, medical insurance, and rentals, I believe you'll see that inflation has invaded those spaces. And I think that um, for anyone that is looking to buy real estate for the long term, I think that the ability to understand this new stimulus is also going to, as time goes on, increase rents. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Okay. And I have another question. I'm piggyback okay. off of uh, Frank uh, <laughs> or the last question that Anna had. I think I we'll, guess we'll leave that as a last because I have some comment and they certainly they can email us so they can post and in a group that will be sharing it, I guess, in advance, right, Jay, you can post some questions there, that's possible. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, do you, you have any more? Do you have any more to go through? Or I have one more, Rob. That's for you. Okay. okay, Anna. Before you go on to that one, can I just I just wanted to touch on the yeah. flipping thing. So yeah, with the flipping, I think what's going to happen is it not so much um, cut people out. I, I think it'll, if anything, that 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 drop that Frank was saying that five to twelve percent that you know trusted people are saying that might cut people out if they're if they're cut if it's a contractor that's trying to just keep busy or you know people working on very small margins i think uh if you have an investor that's looking at like a traditional you know if you're looking at 30 percent um 70 percent of the arv minus repairs and you're buying on that kind of margin it's kind of built in that if something like this happens you're protected against a five to ten percent drop your, your profit will be you just won't you won't eat it but you won't make that much but opposed to somebody who's just trying to make 10 or 20 grand, you can lose all the meat on the bone and then be negative. Um, and it depends on what kind of financing they do too. If they're doing hard money, that that, that eats away real quick too. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to add that in um, and before we went on to the last question. Absolutely. And the last question is, Rob, Yep. how much money do we need to retire today? <laughs> how much do I need? How much? How, well, well, let me make sure I understand the question. How much money yearly income wise or? I, I, I quoted that. How much money do we need to retire today? So you can take it, elaborate as you wish. Um, well, the question is how much money do I need to retire today? Wow. So the, my first question is what are your expenses? Do you want the money to be tax free or do you want it to be taxable? What, what is the lifestyle that you're used to um, are you married with kids? Are you single? So, so to answer that question is difficult. By the way, you can give my private information and I'd love to speak to anybody, um, but I can't really give an answer on that other than you want to be able to- Generic, generics, just the- uh... A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Tax-free. Tax-free or tax-efficient as possible. Okay. And I know we all like to live well, so it's definitely a lot, right? I think it's about, um, you know, what is your, what is the point of the money? The, is it about lifestyle? Is it about um, extravagant spending? Is it about contribution and service? Is it about growing? Um, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different aspects of that. And what is your relationship with money? And, and to answer the question, you always want to be able to pay your bills, but I don't, I don't ever believe in just paying bills. I, I want to be able to make sure that I can do things and, and, and money is a measurement of being able to do those things that you want to do. Um, you want it to be congruent and consistent with your moral code. And, um, you know, just it, it really ties into what you've been doing and where you want to go. And then I could answer that more clear if I have more information. Rob, maybe you want to share your information uh, for whoever's watching and maybe they can reach out to you directly on that particular topic. Yes. Uh, you guys can reach me at info at epicwm.com, info at epicwm.com. And, and by the way, Anna, Frank, everybody else, thank you so much for this opportunity today. I, I do love real estate, and, and I think real estate is a great uh, investment in the overall planning process, and it gives you a lot of control, and it really turbocharges your wealth. Awesome. Awesome. And Thanks, Rob. Sorry. If you want to share your information, please, for any questions on financing, uh, sure. investment property, or obviously anything related, if you would like to share your info. Yeah, absolutely. You guys can always reach me via email at F uh, Minetti. So that's F-M-O-N-E-T-T-I, probably the way you see it spelt, uh, spelt on the screen there. And that's at advisorsmortgage.com. Or always can reach out to me on my cell. It's a 908 513 one two zero two or obviously alan jay and anna and rob all have my contact information as well so we look forward to definitely talking to everybody and also if anybody wants to uh go over any sort of real estate investing all five of us have uh experience um you know different areas i do flipping you know alan's done rentals i think anna's done both you know we, we pretty much cover the whole gamut. So if anybody wanted to hop on a Zoom and ask more specific one-on-one -on -one questions, just shoot any of us a message. Uh, let us know who you want to get together with and we're happy to give you our, our time. 
And uh, and once again, thanks uh, Frank for and, and Rob for joining us. This was really awesome. Yeah, yes. yes, thank you. Thanks for having us. No problem. Best of the best. You guys. Love it. Thanks. Have a great day, guys. Good luck. You too. Good luck. Yep. Bye bye. Bye bye.